Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Be cautious of the shayateen amongst the humans. So this one he's studying right now. Yeah. And we studied, alhamdulillah, kitab al tawheed Even though it was a, cons even though it was a concise ex explanation, but there's no problem. The first time a person studies kitab al tawheed it cannot be a detailed explanation. And similarly, when it comes to fiqh, there's no problem in studying fiqh firstly summarized. And a shaitan comes to a person and says, what do you benefit from studying fiqh like this? We don't require this fiqh. Or a person says regarding a Shaykh al Saadi, he's died, may Allah mercy upon him. So there are some shayateen amongst the humans, they themselves do not study and neither do they desire for you to study. Um, let's go drink coffee. As for the lesson, it's recorded, don't worry about the lesson. So this Dora, it's only for two or three days. And many of you, you wanted the lessons, you wanted the Shaykh to visit. And now that the lesson begins, then problems. Do you think that a Shaykh Ibn Uthameen rahimullah he used to play? A Shaykh Ibn Uthameen rahimullah, he completed the study of a whole book with his Shaykh, Shaykh Saadi. And when he completed the whole book with him alone, studying the book, Shaykh Saadi he became happy. And so he gave him a gift. And he didn't give him 50 pounds, rather he gave him an apple. Because an apple in Qasim in those days was rare. And it was something expensive and precious. So a Shaykh Ibn Uthami, rahimullah, he took this apple and he went to his house. And he's looking at the apple and he doesn't know what to do with the apple. Is it consumed or is it cooked? He does not know. So he came back to a Shaykh Saadi and he said, look, this, this, what, what do I do with this? Because Ibn Uthami, he did not know playing. And do you, not, do you think that the shayateen amongst the humans did not come to a Shaykh Ibn Uthami and try to doubt him? Yeah, yeah. Place doubts regarding the books of a Shaykh Saadi? We studied al-wudu and al-ghusl and al-tayammum. Uh, and then there are two types of water. Either it is pure or impure. The no. water which is pure is that water which remains in its original natural state. Whether it is water which descends from the skies as rain, or water from springs and fountains, or water in rivers, any type, any water which is in its natural state, this is pure. And therefore, we cannot consider it to be impure unless that water changes. Either its smell changes, or its color changes, or its taste changes. And we consider it to be impure when any one of these three qualities change due to an impurity. As for one of its, these qualities changing with something which is pure, like for example, Now, for example, if... Uh, leaves of a tree fell into the water this does not make it najas so if me and Abu abbas if we differed regarding the state of this water i say that it is impure i say that it is pure and he says that it is impure who is right the sheikh is right always why because the asal the base default ruling with regards to what is purity and therefore the one who says that it is impure he is demanded to bring proof and also we have the siwak, and uh, siwak is the it is the stick which is from the root of the tree or the plant or any other type uh, of of matter or any other thing by which a person is able to clean his mouth and it does not damage his his mouth and. And neither does the siwak break by merely brushing the teeth. This is called a siwak. And using a siwak is an emphasized sunnah. In fact, it is so emphasized that we have with us a hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that using the siwak pleases Allah. And so using the siwak, i.e. brushing the teeth, it is recommended and encouraged in every time. Whether a person is fasting or not. When making wudu, before salah, before reciting Quran, before qiyam al layl when a person enters the house in order to uh, change the odor which is emanating from the mouth, and also before death. How before death? Because the Prophet wasallam, before he passed away, he used the miswak, he brushed his teeth. And this shows and indicates that this religion of Islam, it encourages us with hygiene and cleanliness and good etiquettes and good practices. And therefore there is no religion like the religion of Islam. And also from the etiquettes or the good practices of Islam is that which pertains to answering the call of nature. Firstly, it is an obligation for a person when urinating 
that he's far removed and concealed from the sight of the people. For example, closing the door. Now. Or if he is in an open space, hiding behind a tree or a stone or being far away from the people. And from the etiquettes is that a person does not enter into the lavatories with anything which contains the name of Allah like the Quran or the Mus'haf. Also, when a person enters into that place, then he is obligated to stop mentioning well, the name of Allah. And neither does he converse or have any normal speech. And also, before a person enters into the toilets, he says, in the name of Allah, and then he says, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika mil khubthi wal khaba'ith. And when he enters the toilet, he enters with his left foot. And when he exits from the toilet, he exits with his right foot. And after he has exited, he seeks forgiveness by saying Ghufranak. And also when urinating uh, or answering the call of nature, neither does he face the Qibla with his front, nor does he give his back to the Qibla. And from the etiquettes of answering the call of nature that he does not do so in any place or path which would harm others, whether they are non-Muslims or the people of innovation. Also, a person is not permitted to urinate in still standing water and he does not touch his private parts with his right hand. And he is permitted to urinate standing up but with two conditions. That firstly, the droplets of urine do not splash back onto him or his clothing and also that his aura or his private parts are not exposed in front of others. So when a person has finished answering the call of nature, and then after this a person has to cleanse that place from which the impurity was discharged. And this is done either through water or stones, handkerchiefs, leaves or tissue. As for cleansing and purifying using water, this is clear. As for cleansing oneself using tissue, papers or handkerchiefs, there are certain conditions. The first condition is that this itself has to be pure. Uh, and also, the, the paper which you are using to cleanse yourself, it cannot be something which is yani, respectable, meaning it cannot be a book or knowledge or, or musaf. And neither is a person permitted to use anything which is food of humans or beings or the animals of humans and jinn. And a person has to wipe himself three times. Either he uses three separate pieces of tissue, or if it's a long piece of paper or handkerchief, then he can use different parts three times. As for when a person cleanses himself once, then that part it has now become najas. And same with a stone. So the minimum amount of wipes that a person must wipe his private parts with is three. And if on this third time the paper is dry, meaning there's no najasa and there's no wetness, then a person can stop. The person has considered or considers his private parts to be clean. However, if after the third time there's st still some wetness of urine or there's some najasa from one's feces, then he continues until the paper or the handkerchief is dry. And if a person has finished wiping himself, for example, with six wipes or six stones or six handkerchiefs, then it's recommended for a person to stop on an odd number, not on an even number. So he does it one more time. And also a person should not be affected by paranoia. A person, after having purified himself, should not be affected by paranoia. Some people, they'll remain in the toilet cleansing themselves for a whole hour. And this is all paranoia from shaitan. A person might have wiped himself with a hundred different tissues of tissue paper, a lot of water. Um, and then after 15 minutes, he might return back to the masjid. And then after another 15 minutes, he returns back to the masjid because he believes every time he has left that area and cleansed himself, he's impure. And he thinks that he is ill because of droplets of urine and there's nothing wrong with him. So you have to do that which Allah commanded you to do. After you have purified yourself, come and pray. Nobody said that you have to jump in the toilet or so go around the masjid. So if a person says that I am certain 100% that a droplet of urine was discharged. This is not that, that illness in which there is a continuous discharge of urine. This sometimes is an effect of washing with water. So don't be affected by paranoia. Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah, he said, that tiny amounts of nijasa are overlooked, forgiven. And in any case, this paranoia it is from shaitan. And then after this, we come to haid, which are the menses. And haid, 
men says, i.e. the periodic bleeding of women, the most knowing of people regarding this are the women. If a woman asks or questions regarding hayd, how do we answer? So if a woman asks about her bleeding, you say to her, do you know of your regular periods? Meaning, do you have regular periods in which you bleed? For example, five or six days at a particular time. So if she says, yes, I know it, then we say, okay, for these five or six days, you consider yourself to be in a state of hayd, of menses, and then anything in addition this, to this, it is continuous bleeding. Tamam. It's the hadha. So any woman who comes and she's unsure about the rulings of al hayd, you answer her, do you know when you have your regular periods? And if it is known, like those six days, for example, then according to the sharia, for that known time, she is considered to be impure due to her menses. And anything which is in addition to this, then this is istihada. This is regular uh, bleeding. And that woman who knows of her period of, of, of her hayd, then she is known as mu'tada, meaning a woman whose bleeding is regular. A woman came and she asked you and you replied that, do you know the days of your bleeding? She said, no. Sometimes for the whole month there is bleeding. Then she is asked that, are you able to recognize and different or, and distinguish between the blood of the menses and normal bleeding? Like for example, if there's a cut and there's blood, are you able to distinguish between the two types of blood? And if she says, yes, I can distinguish between both, and so then the answer is that as long as you are able to distinguish between the different types of blood then that blood which you consider to be hayd for those days you are in a state of impurity and as for the other days in which the bleeding and the blood is not the blood of the menses through that which you can recognize then this is normal bleeding and we will come to the rulings of al-istihada that she can pray in this time and this woman she's called mumayiza meaning a, a woman who can distinguish between the two types of blood. And then a third woman approaches and she questions regarding her menses and you say to her, do you know your regular period of bleeding? She says no. Are you able to distinguish between the bleeding of the menses and the blood which is normal? She says no. And the terminology which is given to her by the sharia is that she is mutahayyira, meaning she's in a state of confusion. She herself is in a state of confusion and we are confused along with her. So what does she do? Now. She uh, looks at her mother or her sisters or her niece, for example, and she follows them. So if, so if, if one of them or some of them, if they bleeding is, for example, five, for five or six days, then she considers these days of bleeding to be hayd, menses and impurity and the remaining days she is in istihaba. A person who is in a state of minor impurity, which things are forbidden for that person? So firstly, for example, a person who has passed wind, which things are forbidden for that person? He cannot pray, he or she cannot pray. Neither are they allowed to perform tawaf around the Kaaba, and neither are they allowed to touch the mushaf. As for the one who is in a state of major impurity, then he or she <laughs> is not permitted to perform these previous three, meaning no salah and no tawaf and neither touching the mushaf and neither the recitation of the Qur'an and neither is that person permitted to remain in the masjid without performing wudu. And as for the women who are in a state of impurity due to their menses or due to postnatal bleeding, then all of these matters, meaning she does not pray salah, neither does she make tawaf, nor does she touch the mushaf, neither does she enter and remain in the masjid, neither does she fast, nor is she divorced, neither is our intimate relations permitted with her, but she is permitted to recite the Quran. But no. that is without directly touching the mushaf. But it's permitted for her to take a cloth or a stick and she can turn the page. And this is a view of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah that a woman in a state of major impurity due to hayd or nifas postnatal bleeding is not prevented from reciting the Quran. As for wiping over leather socks or fabric socks, fabric footwear, the first condition which permits this is that a person has to have worn that footwear after making a complete wudu including the washing of the feet. And then the fabric socks have to be uh, pure and not impure. And then thirdly, 
that the footwear you are wearing has to cover the majority of your foot. So for example, those socks which don't reach to the ankles, a Sheikh Ibn Uthmeen, rahimullah, his view was that you can make mas'h over them. And you can make mas'h over them because they are still covering the majority of the foot. The next condition of al-mas'h al-khuffain is that it is done due to minor impurity but not major impurity. And it has to be done, or al-mas'h al-khuffain has to be done within the legislated period of time. Meaning, for the one who is resident, 24 hours, i.e. the passing of a night and a day, and a day and the one who is traveling 72 hours, meaning the passing of three nights and three days. And then wiping over casts. So the cast is that which is placed over a bone which has been broken. May Allah save us anew. So if a person is wearing a cast and then intends to perform wudu, do you say to that person that without doubt you have to remove your cast and you have to wash the body part? And a person says, I'm not able to do so. Then we say to the person, you are permitted to wipe over the cast. So if he is able to wipe over, then he wipes over. Another person has an open cut or an open wound. No. He has to wash when performing wudu. If he says, I'm not able to do so, then we say wipe over it. And if he's not able to wipe over, meaning with wet hands, because even a droplet of water will injure him, says, I'm not even able to place my hand over the open wound. What does he do? He performs a full wudu, but without washing the arm. And once he has finished from the wudu, and then he makes intention in his heart, he verbalizes the name of Allah, and then he places his hands once upon the earth, wipes over his face, and then the back of his right, and then the back of his left. So this tayammum is in place of him not even wiping over the arm. And also, it is permitted for a woman to wipe over her headscarf. Because you know, especially in this time, for example, in the winter, it's difficult for her to remove her headscarf so she can wipe over her headscarf. And then here, the ulama, they speak about the rulings of using utensils. And why do they speak about utensils in the chapter of purification? Because water, it's a liquid. And therefore, a liquid, it requires a container. And these containers are the utensils. So the asal, the base default ruling when it comes to utensils is that they are pure. Even if they come from China or from any other Muslim. No. No. If they are the utensils of the non-Muslims, then the asal is that they are pure. Except utensils which have been manufactured from gold or silver, they are not permitted to be used. So what is the ruling of using utensils from the kuffar? Are they tahir, pure or impure? Three types. Firstly, if we know that they are pure, then they are pure. If we know that those utensils are impure because they have been utilized for something which is impure, like for example, a container Dosa. of, of khinzir, of swine, then they are, then they are washed no. and then they are pure. And then the third situation is that we are in doubt. We don't know whether they are pure or impure. Al -asl -ish. Then we go back to the base default ruling. At and that is that they are pure. Tamam. Izalat al najas. And then after this, the removal of physical impurities. Izalat al najas ala thalathati aqsam. Kayfa nuzil al najas. So there are three ways of purifying and removing an impure, a physical impurity. So firstly, if the najasa, if the physical impurity is from a dog, akramakumullah, such that the dog licks or drinks from the utensil, and a dog only u drinks from the utensil by using his tongue and the saliva of the dog, then how does purification occur? Firstly, you have to spill everything which was contained in the utensil. Naam. And then secondly, you have, to, you have to clean it with soil. And then after cleansing it with soil, then, there are seven, then it is washed seven times with water. The second type of najasa, al-madhi, and what is al-madhi? So al-madhi is a, is a discharge liquid which has no color, it's transparent like water. And this uh, madhi, it is discharged due to a thought based upon desires, or an action based upon desires. And this, and like kissing, and this invalidates a person's wudu. And a person has to wash his frontal private part and the testicles, so we are sure that it is clean. If a person's, if a madhi, it soils a person's clothing. What do I do? You take water and you uh, spray or sprinkle on the cloth. And this is so, sufficient. 
and there is no najasa at the minute. So it invalidates a person's wudu. So you have to repeat wudu and you have to wash your private part and the area around that. But when it comes to the thobe, you sprinkle water on it. I'm just sprinkling. So this person, this teacher, he entered into the lavatories. And whilst he was there, a droplet of urine, it soiled his clothes. What does he do? He takes the clothing, he takes the piece of cloth where there is the droplet of urine and he sprinkles water on it and then he squeezes it out. And now it is pure. And he doesn't need to go to his house and take off his thobe and change it and wash it. Why? Because the religion is easy. So there are three ways of purifying from impurities. Firstly, the impurity of a dog and this is seven times the first with soil. And then after this, al-madhi, which is that discharge based upon desires, ba and this is sprinkling over it. And then the other remaining physical impurities by sprinkling water over it and then squeezing the water out. So, alhamdulillah, we have studied Kitab al-Tahara. And we mentioned that a person begins with the purification of his inner self. And then after this, his outer self. And as for the Tahara, which is apparent and physical, this is the tahara from al-hadath and physical impurity. And we said that the states of hadath or the states of impurity are major and minor. And as for purifying yourself from the physical impurities, and this is your clothing and your body and the area which you are worshipping Allah. As for your clothing, then sprinkling water over it and then squeezing the water out. Apart from al-madhi, it only requires as for utensils, then seven times of cleansing, the first of which is with soil. We also studied al hayd and similar to this is postnatal bleed. As for al-istihada, which is continuous bleeding after the uh, bleeding of the menses, then a woman prays. And as for semen, it is not impure. Why? Because semen is the substance from which human was created. And the Prophet wasallam, if his clothing was soiled with semen, if it was still wet, then he would sprinkle water over it. No. And if it had become dry, then he would scrub it off. Turaju Ulana Min Kitab Manhaj Salikin, Kitab al Tahara, when Shalla Ta'ala Bada Salat, Al Maghrib, Al Maghrib, Nahoth Kitab Nuraja, when Ahoth Kitab al Salah, Wallahu Alamus, Lala Nabi Muhammad, Wallah Sahibu Salam, Wajazakum, Wallahu Khair.